here today with Ed Beard. I've been a huge fan of his artwork for a number of years now, and I really wanted to get the opportunity to delve a little bit more into some of the details of it all. So could you start us off with uh, your background prior to getting into the gaming industry? Well, I was first inspired to get into the art back in 75, 76. It, I, was a, I remember being in school, seeing a slideshow that was all about the great masters of the Renaissance, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, and whatnot. And I, just like every other kid, I was into G.I. Joe and Hot Wheels and whatever else. But then I just went home, took out a book at the library, and just got totally addicted to that kind of art. I started copying everything I could see in the books. I spent the whole summer just uh, drawing and drawing and drawing and practicing. And then I, before you knew it, I was studying the anatomy. I read on, you know, how did the great masters do it? Well, if they studied anatomy, I should do it, of animals and humans. And I became really quickly, within two years, pretty proficient at black and white sketching. And it was just something like an epiphany. Um, so by the time I got into seventh and eighth grade, I, I felt pretty confident in my black and white skill sets. I'd use my art any time I could, you know, even if it meant uh, drawing cartoons and pictures up on the chalkboard before the class started. Usually of a, of a guy sitting on a toilet or something like that. It was really, you know, something funny and embarrassing. And I got in trouble every now and then for that. But um, didn't have much uh, support in the school uh, for my art. Uh, the art teacher didn't take favor to me too much. Um, I was a, a rather stubborn individual, and at the same time, I loved fantasy art, and that wasn't a true art form back then in the 70s, you know, it was, I wasn't interested in the dot in the middle of the square canvas, so, oh well, I did, com I guess I was considered commercial. So I, uh, I knew really right off the bat that if I was going to do art, it wasn't going to be something I was going to go to college for, it was something that was going to take my skill set to the, to the marketplace, and so I got into what I was into at the time, which was Hot Rods and Harley Davidson's, I had my own Hot Rod and I built up, and my buddies always had them, so I said, well, maybe I can do some of that artwork there. So I learned to use the airbrush, uh, I learned to use quills, pinstriping, and lettering enamel and stuff like that. So uh, before you knew it, I was starting to do regularly automotive work and taking the same imagery of fantasy, which was very popular in the late 70s for vans and, and cars, and applying it there. So I kind of started off as an automotive muralist, um, always wanting to do game art and illustration and fantasy art in publications, but this was long before the internet, so there was really no way for me to connect with that market, except to mail your portfolio in the mail, which sat on people's desks for months and end, and then you get this generic, thank you for submitting your portfolio, but at this time we're not looking for work, you know, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I, I, it was a rough road in the beginning years, but uh, I made the best of it through my automotive art and, uh, and working that way. So can you tell us how, what was really your first big break into the hobby? Well, um, Game illustration, boy, that came around 1988. I was going into, uh, I was driving by with my wife a comic book store, and we said, let's check it out. Let's see what's going on with the comic industry. And we went inside. We saw he had carried some game stuff, and I saw some D and D stuff, some Monster Compendium, some books, and that first got my attention. And then I was looking at the comic books around, and I'm like, you know, I could do some of this stuff. Maybe I can do some work for the for the store. And I suggest I could do some airbrushing on T-shirts of the, you know, DC and Marvel characters and whatnot. And um, so I did some work, I brought in those things, and some paintings I was doing, and I had at that, uh, actually at that time I was collecting the collectible art cards, um, right around 87, 88, I think it was the beginning of the card market, collectible art cards, not game cards, and he had some of those in there, and he said, you know what, your work really is reminiscent of this, and you know, you may even consider going to this convention called Gen Con. And I went, well, what is that? And he tells me it's up in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and you should consider, you know, checking out, maybe going there, showing you work. Well, my wife and I weren't exactly financially uh, doing well, and I was like, that's going to cost us a couple of thousand dollars to get up there. You got to rent the booth, but I still try. I, I said, well, let me give it a shot. So I called up uh, TSR at the time, and I said, you know, would you uh, have a place that I get a space that maybe I can rent a booth or whatever? And it was a pretty hefty fee. It was everything we had. But I said, all right, fine. So I get my little Ford, I don't remember what it was, a Topaz, I think it was some crappy little car. Got it all packed up with my artwork. And I went to, to Gen Con. Uh, I had been referred to Gen Con from another, uh, another person from another show, too. I think it was Dragon Con. Um, I had, that was the first year I'd gone to those shows. But uh, that was the one that really said, you should really get into the gaming industry. This is something that I think your work would be right for. So I put up my artwork at Gen Con. And I had it on display, and it was like, I don't know, an hour after I had the show had opened, 
And all of a sudden, the art director from Wizards of the Coast, this nobody company at the time, was going to intend to put out this card game, as they described it to me, as being a half card of art and a half card of text. And he says, we're going to pay 50 bucks a card. And of course, I said, no way. <laughs> I'm not going to work for 50 bucks a card, so I'll pass. That was the wrong gamble. I did that once. I wouldn't do that again, of course. But yeah, yeah, I said no the first time. And of course, the set came out, and it was a big success. And that same art director, the following summer, calls me up, because I went back to Gen Con, and he says, would you be interested in working for us now? We're paying $100 a card now. I said, yeah, sure, we'll do that. But uh, yeah, I said no at first, because I really just didn't, I didn't see it as a successful thing. I kept looking, I'm going, this little teeny bit of artwork, and a little... But of course, I was looking at it from the artist's point of view, you know, looking at collecting art cards, you know, with these beautiful big two and a half by three, you know, pieces of art. And I'm thinking, what on earth is going to be the interest for a gamer who's playing D&D &D or, you know, board games where you have all this visual stimulation and you got to look at this little teeny posted stamp of art. But I didn't, I didn't know the mechanics of the game. I didn't understand the, the addiction quality that was going to come later on when Magic hit the market. So, but that is how it happened. It, I mean, I thought about it. I went, my God, I've been pitching companies for 15 years, sending my resume and portfolio, which has done nothing but sit on desks. And I show up for this one show, I'm here an hour, and I get hired. You know, that was so awesome. So being at the right place at the right time, but required me to be everywhere all the time for 15 years till it happened. That's the best way I can say. That doesn't sound like an easy formula for success. No. <laughs> no. No. But if it was easy, you wouldn't be doing it. Right. Nothing worthwhile ever comes easy, and yes, that has been the testimony for my entire life, and I'm happy to say that it's okay, it works. It, it definitely worked out really good. Um, what mediums do you use, and which ones do you prefer? Well, I started off with oil painting, like many, you know, I, I, of course, when I was beginning, uh, very young anyways, but when I got my first oils, I was 13, 14, and I experimented with them doing portraiture and stuff, and I, I did oil portraits right through the 80s. Um, and that's a great, it's a wonderful medium oil is for using for portrait work and stuff. But I, I also felt, especially since I had always been subjected to the fumes of the automotive paints and stuff, I wanted to go into a water-based medium. So I gave a shot at the acrylics. And I knew acrylics were a difficult medium to work with. I was told that from so many artists. Uh, it, the blendability is not there. You, you're pushing plastic beads. That's what acrylics is. It's basically little plastic micro beads um, with a medium. And, but I said, you know, I think I can make this work with a combination of the airbrush for those gradient tones, and then the brushwork for things that are more opaque and solid. Not to mention use uh, uh, misted airbrush to create translucencies. Kind of like you glaze with an oil uh, painting, you maybe use glazes, uh, you can create a simulated effect with the acrylics. Um, not to mention I could use watercolors and things like that. So I did. I, you know, I started using water-based medium and uh, I managed to get a pretty good technique down where for the last 20 years, most people look at my work and they, they can't figure out what it is. They don't know what medium it is because it's, it's a combination of things that look very photorealistic and then things that are very opaque and bold and are brushed. And they're like, acrylics don't do that. How did you make that happen? You know, so, yeah. How has your technique evolved over the years? Well, you know, working in automotive and, and doing these hot rods and so forth, uh, you are working on round curved, metal, reflective, non-absorbent surfaces. So you have to use friskets. You have to cut micro stencils with, uh, you know, you draw out your line work first, and then you have to have very accurate frisket stencils to prevent overspray from occurring. Because although you can do airbrush freehand on, on automotive, if you want that nice, tight, crisp look, you've got to do frisket work. So there's many more layers involved in that. Now, that same technique, to an extent, is applied to the canvases and two-dimensional surfaces. But the benefit of canvas and the benefit of board illustration work is that it absorbs more. Um, so it is more like a dry brush medium. So I realized from the beginning when I was doing very crisp, photorealistic airbrush work on the two-dimensional boards and canvases, that I could incorporate a more freestyle and a little more oil painting effect, a more natural brush work, and have a kind of a hybrid between the two. So my technique evolved from what was a very polished, very tight airbrush uh, photorealistic look to a stylized look uh, where mm, I created my own unique style. And that was the thing I wanted to do more than anything is I never wanted my work to appear to be something that, oh, clearly he just photographed models for this particular scene. 
I wanted it to look as if it was believable in that it's shadowed correctly, it's in the right perspective, uh, the environment's uh, legitimate, the coloring is right and accurate. It's not cartoony, but by the same token, it's not photorealistic. And the best way to achieve that is to work off your mind. So everything I do is basically 100% right out of my mind without reference material, so that I'm not tending to create images that look like they're photographically reproduced. And that's how my style definitely evolved. It went from realistic portraiture of oils to, at the same time, auto body, very photographic work, to now what I do and have done for the last 20 years, which is a, a stylized, kind of slightly off reality look. And I'm very happy with that, that technique. It, it helps to identify, you know, what your work looks like. And I would say this too, um, I've got people who will go into my studios or my Renaissance Fair shops and conventions and stuff and they see my whole array of work and there's four or five different approaches or techniques that are used even with the same medium. Because some images require a more photorealistic approach such as with architecture or mechanical illustration versus uh, something that's more organic. I, I'm not the kind of artist um, that will take every subject, no matter what it is, and force my technique on it. I believe in allowing the subject to dictate what medium I use or the technique that I use. So, in the case of the difference between an organic scene, which is uh, a natural scene of a forest or uh, an ocean scene or whatever, I may go with a more brushwork look. But if it's something that is an architectural building that has very precise marble cutting, I'll use a frisket and airbrush to get that in crispness. So it depends on the subject matter.